I welcome you all in day 10 of our uh, summer school. The today topic for our lecture is AI for transportation. And first of all, I, I would I would like to I would like to thank our exporters who are CIFAR, Mila, Volkswagen Group of America, Wild Sphere, AI. Now, climate change is a, is a, is a global nonprofit uh, organization that works at the intersection of climate change and machine learning. Uh, you can know more about uh, uh, climate change by visiting our website, that is www.climatechangeai. You can also follow us at the Twitter, Climate Change AI. To our, uh, you can join us our community platform, and you can also join our newsletter to know more about our recent, uh, recent uh, work. So the main, one of the main part of our today's summer school is the asking question in the community. You can ask, uh, you can ask questions using the lecture Q&A channel on the CCAI community platform. Uh, I apologize, we apologize that, that due to the high number of participant, uh, participants, we will not be able to answer all the questions. Questions with more reports will, uh, will, will have a higher chance of being asked and be answered. You can join the lecture Q&A community now to ask the questions. Uh, the one more thing that all the participants are requested to abide by uh, all the CCA code of conduct in case any situation arises, please report to the Reporting at the reporting at climate change AI. The main speaker for our today lecture are Constantine Klamer and Nicola Milojevic Dupont, and the TA for today lectures are myself Tariq Shazad and Bernard Okoko. And now the biography for our today. Uh, Speaker is Dr. Uh, Dr. Bustan Klamer is a postdoctoral researcher currently at Microsoft Research Center at New England. He recently completed his PhD at the University of Warwick and New York University, supervised by his Professor Stephen Jarvis, Daniel Neal, and Honkai Wen at University of Warwick. He, he was also an enrichment student at the Alan, Alan Turing Institute and a Beyond Fellow at TUMDLR. His research mainly focuses on the representation of spatial phenomena in machine learning methods. He is also interested in the application of application of these methods in the urban environment and to take climate challenge, to tackle uh, climate challenges. And our other speaker for today's lecture is uh, Nicola Milojevic Dupont. He is currently a PhD researcher at the Technical University of Berlin. His research focuses on developing machine learning applications for climate change for climate change mitigation with a particular focus on demand side solution in, in cities arising from buildings and transportation system. He's also working with artificial neural networks and massive spatial data, including remote, remote sensing and geographical, voluntarily geographical information. Now the floor is over to our speaker. The Thank you. Now, uh, I hand over to the our speakers. Yes, thank you, Tariq, for the introduction. For the introduction. Um, why can I hear so myself twice? Okay, I can hear myself twice anymore. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the uh, day ten of the Climate Change AI Summer School. After nine exciting days, we're moving gears a little bit and switch to exciting topic AI for transportation. And um, yeah, just uh, thanks for the great introductions, but also just uh, briefly about myself and then Nicola will say a few words about himself. So my journey into, into this kind of transportation domain is very interdisciplinary one. I did like, I did an economics undergraduate, I did a master's in transportation and a PhD in computer science. But what, what is really exciting to me about transportation, especially urban transportation, is its complexity and how it's interconnected with so many other aspects of human life. And of course, also aspects of broader planetary systems like climate change. So I'm excited to give this lecture and uh, yeah, very excited about developments and research in this area. Um, hi, everyone. Very happy to be here with all of you today. 
Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm Nicola Milevich Dupont. So I'm at the end of my PhD journey, um, also on similar topics uh, coming mostly from the perspective of climate change mitigation so, uh, into this intersection of uh, climate change and AI. And um, yeah, also similar background to, to Constantine with uh, environmental economics, uh, but then moving to some yeah more urban planning, really looking at the systems of, of city from an infrastructure perspective as opposed to uh, an economic one. And yeah. I'll be very happy to discuss a bit more this uh, climate change mitigation perspective and how to look into a pathway to action to, to get these different machine learning and AI tools uh, applied in an impactful way um, in this space. So um, yeah, back to you, Constantine. All right. So today we're going to journey through the whole um, landscape that connects uh, AI to transportation. And we're gonna start with talking about especially urban transportation, which is gonna be the focus of the lecture. Um, so how does the urban transportation landscape look like? What are the different actors there? What are different factors to consider? And we're gonna move over to the connection between transportation sector and climate, ch uh, and gli uh, climate change in general. Gonna move on to some news cases. Um, and we're going to close with kind of first an outlook, what are kind of the future developments we can expect and uh, going to close with uh, pathways to impact, right? How can we how can we use AI to really drive impact in the sector? And the learning objectives from this lecture really should be to understand the multidimensional context in which AI and transportation intersect and um, the need to kind of encapsulate these uh, very different uh, dimensions in order to um, yeah, drive a theory of change. Um, second objective is that really the biggest impact for emission reductions in the transportation uh, domain comes through efficiency gains and uh, redistribution of trips from carbon heavy trips to, to uh, green mobility. And this is where AI can have an impact. Um, next up, Successful deployment of AI solutions and transportation requires um, working together between the private and the public sector. A lot of transportation um, is not provided uh, by the private sector, but by the public sector. And um, yeah, both of them need to work together as well with civic society um, to, to um, successful deploy solutions. And the last, uh, maybe the most important point is that there's no like one size fits all solution for different parts of the world, uh, very different um, uh, Parts of the planet have uh, kind of different approaches to mobility and there's different ways in which um, problems can be tackled. And uh, AI is very much at the tail end of many of these solutions in, in, in many parts of the world that can kind of decarbonize um, much more impactful with other solutions. Throughout the lecture, we're going to have a little case study to kind of break up the just me and Nicola talking. Um, so uh, we'll uh, basically uh, present you with a case study um, on uh, yeah, real world uh, kind of inspired ca case study um, the, akin to a tech uh, tech interview for like data scientist position at a mobility company like uh, Uber or so. And um, the questions we asked they will be focused on first uh, metrics and measures of mobility demand, then kind of the features that we believe would be good predictors of that, and the methodological approach, and lastly how to implement such solutions and the real world climate impact. And yeah, very briefly, the this the kind of role you should take for this um, little question session is that you're a data scientist at the right hailing company and you're tasked with building a demand forecasting model that given a specific time and location will return a projected trip demand. And yeah, we're going to revisit this, this questions, uh, these questions throughout the lecture um, in three different little breakouts um, where you guys have the opportunity to give your own thoughts on what you think. Um, the answers to these questions are. Now, yeah, let's just uh, jump right into the first part of the um, of the lecture, which is the urban transportation landscape. And to kick us off, I have a little video that I would like to show you. So let's get going. This is the Vegas Loop, Elon's answer to traffic. It's gonna save about 15 minutes or 20 minutes of walking. I'm gonna show you what that looks like. We take the escalators downstairs and pick up a Tesla. This is the central station. So this is what the Vegas Loop by Boring and Tesla looks like. Going west? Yep, you can go number two. Awesome, thank you. 
Howdy. How you doing? Good. We have one? Yeah. Okay, you're gonna ride with these two people. Right? Perfect. Hi, how's it going? And here's our car. There we go. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, how's it going? Good, good. Cool, cool. Surviving it? Me too. Or just starting. <laughs> No. I, I love this actually. Yes. <laughs> this job. Oh yeah. I love the awesome. Happy rainbow lights. Yeah. Amazing. Just like that, you said a 20 minute walk. Just like that. Just like that. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Top vehicles will go down. And then they go down into the loop. By far one of the coolest things at CES. And one of the things that you're gonna see the most on TikTok and Instagram probably this year. All right, so. What you saw in the video is a little presentation of um, uh, a system that um, Elon Musk with his uh, boring company in Tesla built in Las Vegas, um, which is kind of basically a tiny tunnel um, that will uh, drive you from point A to point B. These points, like this, uh, this kind of little trip will save you around 15 minutes of walking. And um, you might wonder, you know, what, the, what does this have to do with AI? Um, the point I think that this video makes much more is, is much more broader, and that is a kind of a point about and that that we've been iterating throughout the summer school um, is tech solutionism is not always kind of the right thing. And um, uh, something like uh, like what you saw in this video, which you know might look like a fancy solution, you know, you you go down into into an underground um, into an underground tunnel, you kind of pick up a little Tesla, and you, you drive for fifteen minutes. There's actually a lot of inefficiencies there, right? So, first off, um, why why would you use such a small car to transport people if you could just take something like a bus? Uh, the tunnel is, is is very small and you know basically a, a fire hazard. And there just come so many more solutions to mind than uh, you know deploying this kind of very specific and um, yeah more like a gadget kind of thing. And um, this is kind of a theme that throughout the, the lecture we'll also have. I think a lot of solutions um, in um, modern uh, mobility systems, modern transportation, AI solutions and otherwise are not necessarily the, the sexiest ones, right? So a lot of them will focus on um, communal travel, uh, pool travel, uh, public transportation. And um, I think it's very important that we reiterate throughout the lecture that this is something that we'll we'll have to, especially in like dense urban environments. This is something we just can't get around if we really want to make a make an effort for uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction and just overall mitigating effects in the transportation domain. This is the Vegas loop. All right, to answer to play that video again. Yeah. All right. And this is kind of a very famous picture that many of you maybe have seen. But um, this is the same same number of people um, on on both sides of this image. Like uh, on one side, you have all these people in an individual car, and on one side, you have all these people fitting in one bus. And again, I think this just greatly re reiterates that, especially in, in dense environments, um, we need to really think mobility with a focus on 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 community and on you know um, accepting that. Um, individualizing all transport might not might be you know might be good for us provide us with an individual space but will also yeah destroy our cities right so let's let's jump right into into the urban mobility landscape and how we can um yeah separate that up a little bit and the first kind of separation i want to make is the separation between public and private transportation and that comes right after this image right so on the left side we have public transportation on the right side we have private transportation so public transportation modes are buses, trams, trains. Basically, these are shared spaces that are available for everyone. Whereas with private transportation, we mean individual modes like a car or a bike or a scooter. These are either privately owned vehicles or vehicles that we um, rent. Be that for a short or a longer time. A second important um, separation is that between active and passive transportation. So active transportation uh, means are all these where you um, where you yourself power your vehicle. So that could be something like a skateboard. It could also be a bike, or it could just you be walking. And the uh, cool thing about active transportation, there is no emissions except the emissions that come from a human being walking around. Um, passive modes of transportation are those that are powered by an engine. These can have emissions if there's a combustion engine, but it can also be, um, yeah, uh, if it's an electric engine there much less uh, emissions associated with, uh, with, uh, with that mode of transportation. 
Yeah, and um, that brings us to green versus non-green transportation. So green transportation are active transportation and I, all other sorts that basically have a lower carbon footprint, right? So even if a train might be powered by a diesel engine, because those emissions are shared with a lot of people, it's still a greener way of transportation than uh, maybe driving around in your own car. And uh, yeah, non-green uh, transportations are uh, those where, yeah, especially when you're in, in an individual vehicle with a combustion engine. Next up, let's talk about urban transportation infrastructure. So um, the urban transportation infrastructure is um, one that is uh, usually provided by the public sector. That is because it's just very uh, expensive to provide infrastructure. If you imagine each kind of individual private train provider building their own rails, that is just not feasible. The, basically, the barriers to, to, to market entrance for infrastructure provision are so high that usually those are given by the, by the public sector. And then sometimes you have kind of private operators on top of that. And yeah, urban uh, transportation infrastructure includes streets and highways, um, stuff like uh, dedicated spaces on the street, like bus lanes or bike lanes. And for rail, it includes uh, the different types of rail, like regular rail, light rail, trams, all this kind of stuff. There's also beyond rail and roads, there are other supporting infrastructure like power masts um, or docking stations. I, I, I touched on this briefly already, but um, yeah, basically who, who are the operators of uh, mobility um, in cities? Uh, on the one side, you have public operators. They're not necessarily profit driven, but utility driven. Usually they have like a little bit of a, a goal of kind of how much of their expenses they need to achieve. But beyond that, they are really driven by whatever the urban government wants uh, to provide in terms of mobility. Um, they can operate at a loss and they are aligned more uh, easily with uh, general uh, urban policy goals. On the other hand, you have the private operators who are profit driven and um, they uh, basically will focus all their mobility operations on, on areas, uh, both geographical and yeah, technical areas where they can actually make profit. So they are in a way also detectors of demand, like they will find a niche that uh, they can make money in and that niche will reveal to us that there's demand there. There's also collaborations between the private and the public sector, um, uh, again, especially when there's infrastructure provided by the public sector and um, private private uh, operators built on top of that. Uh, train franchising is like a great example of that. If, you, if you've been to the UK, in the UK, there's lots of different private train operators, but they obviously all operate on the same rail network, which is provided publicly. Um, yeah, another kind of also more recent development in urban mobility is that of intermodal mobility, where trips are less and less done with only one, um, one mode of transport. And instead, uh, we combine different modes of transportation. A good example of that is take you take the commuter train into the city where there's your job. And then for the last mile between the train station and your um, office building, you'll take something like a shared bike um, or you take a, a scooter. And um, with the kind of densification of all these different transportation modes in cities, um, this has become more and more popular uh, with ride hailing, with uh, shared shared vehicles like shared bikes. Yeah, and lastly, I uh, also want to touch a bit on the policy aspect of uh, urban transportation. Um, and that is, is a really tricky one for, for urban planners, for decision makers and governments. Uh, and that is to harmonize uh, different political aims um, all together, right? So one political aim of mobility is, uh, and usually the, the driving one is economic development, because that's uh, what uh, gets officials elected. So economic development, kind of bringing people, uh, to bringing people to their jobs, developing, developing neighborhoods, is usually the first and foremost aim of uh, transportation uh, planning in cities. Uh, reducing emissions is becoming luckily more and more important. Um, and then there might be social um, social goals like uh, connecting marginalized communities. Uh, for for example, London has a, a big program for bringing uh, cycling and bikes to uh, to communities uh, that um, yeah usually uh, don't have that much income, and uh, like provide them with free bikes so they can uh, simplify their commutes. 
yeah and um uh, touching again on the on the kind of private sector aspect it is uh it is uh, can be quite tricky for uh private companies to find a market um, in the urban mobility sector because you already have these public providers that capture a lot of the market and they can operate at a, at a loss and it's it's you, you can't compete with that as a private operator. So what private operators do is, like I said earlier, they find niches and uh, a couple of examples for those are, like I already said, discovering um, trip demand that is not covered by the public sector. Um, good example for that is in New York, uh, trips um, from Manhattan to the Bronx. Um, there are some uh, subways there, of course, but a lot of areas of the Bronx were not covered. And so Uber, the ride hailing company, had uh, like lots of trips um, between Manhattan and the Bronx, especially since some areas of the Bronx are not very safe, especially for women. And so um, they just had lots of trip demand there. Another niche is luxury travel, like um, helicopter travel or so. And um, if private transportation providers become big enough, they can actually, sometimes they can compete with the uh, uh, public sector providers because they can you know, leverage economies of scale. Again, I think Uber is a great example there because they have so much data on, on their customers and they have so much through their data, they, they can discover so much kind of hidden demand that they can adapt their pricing and uh, so forth to that and actually uh, yeah, compete, especially in uh, in in the US, where there's the competition with the public transportation is not very big because it's often not there. All right, I think uh, we're going to switch slides now to Nicola. Yep. Um, so here we go back to the same slide. Yeah. So thanks, Constantine. So um, this yeah gave you um, a little introduction on the space of. Uh, urban transportation and now would like to um, take a little break and start with the first um, case study question um, for you to reflect a little bit on this uh, this content that was given about the urban transportation and start to link it with uh, AI and machine learning. So um, again, the question is in general that you are a data scientist at a big uh, ride hailing company and you are tasked to um, build a demand forecast model that for a specific time and location will return the project um, projected trip demand. So this is pretty much what Constantine was mentioning, for example, in this Uber case just before. And so the, the, the first question here, to answer this, this larger question, the, the first um, um, component here is um, what metrics for measuring trip demand? So which kind of out outcome variables would you, would you think of? And um, what constitutes such a good demand metric? What, what data can you realistically obtain to construct the, construct the metrics? And what special temporal resolution uh, do you want to collect your metrics at what uh, yeah, special and temporal resolution? Um, so you can uh, share those, um, those thoughts um, via the poll that has been shared in, in the chat with you. Um, and you may also use this, this time if you have questions for Constantine, you can write them in the chat as well. And we will be answering a few questions after, after this. Um, yeah, we have our first reply already, I see. Yeah. So um, state government transportation data. Yes. So this is a this is a very good point, and I'll I'll touch on that in a uh, in a bit when I will talk about the urban data landscape. But this is this is a very good point. A lot of, especially cities nowadays, have open data portals where they will uh, publish data about mobility, and um, obviously the governments can only provide the data that um, of the operators that they actually uh, are in charge of. So a good example is like bike sharing, right? So in both cities like uh, New York and um, and London, you will have vast bike sharing data sets. There's also the opportunity for, for uh, yeah, op authorities to um, publish the data of heavily regulated industries like the taxi industry, right? So taxi cars um, usually have transponders that um, um, give the exact locations and depending on the city, this data is also public. So New York, for example, there's a vast uh, taxi data set that, you know, gives the end, start and end point of, of taxi trips. Yeah, do we have more uh, answers, Nicola? Uh, let me see. 
Yes, uh, citizens travel time or number of officing offices around a given point. Mm. Right, so the the citizen travel times, um, that's a bit harder to, to measure exactly. I guess like if you have these kind of taxi trips or start and end points, you, you do have that. Um, but um, yeah, otherwise it's a bit, um, it can be a bit trickier to, to capture that. I know that in London, there's a lot of, um, and then that's not all public, but there's data on like when you check into the subway and when you check out because you need to tap your card. And so you, you do get some uh, travel times from that. All right, and we also had um, a few of our own answers to, to this question. So yeah, first first uh, answer was to, to look for internal data. So trips that are searched for um, in a, a right link app. So not actually completed trip, right? But like search, which is like a, a better indicator of demand. Um, also public data. So same as above, but um, yeah, we obtain data from open data portals. So for example, uh, public taxi trips or data from a public transport operator or like cell phone movement storages. So um, yeah. And uh, a third um, level of answer is like a construct uh, outcome variable of metrics. So this would be to aggregate the origin points of all trips search for in the rate hailing app um, with certain uh, with a certain geographic area within a certain time span. So those would be um, yeah different metric uh, idea for metric for uh, measuring a trip demand. All right. So uh, now we have the, this first overview of uh, urban transportation. We have this little link to um, how it relates to a specific machine learning problem. Let's now um, look how um, this, this urban uh, transportation landscapes fits into the broader climate change mitigation picture. And um, uh, so we will mostly be talking about climate change mitigation, but um, Urban transportation also has dimensions relevant to climate change adaptation. Um, this is something I, I will spend a few slides at the end um, on. Uh, but in general, the, the big chunk is, is on climate change mitigation. Um, so first, some, some first figures and trends on what are the respective contributions of different modes of transportation and uh, where are the biggest issues. And I really want to emphasize the importance of road transportation. Uh, because it represents 70% of the emission of the sector. So we, that's really the, the lion's share, although the other modes are also quite important, as you may imagine planes, for example. So um, these are the, the um, global GHG emissions in the last 30 years. And um, you can see that there has been a huge growth of uh, road transportation emissions. This is the this um, green part here. Um, and uh, you can see that aviation is uh, is eleven percent. Uh, so it's um, it's actually and it's actually more uh, if you consider the warming potential of CO two that is emitting uh, in high altitude. Um, so it's it looks small, but it, it's actually quite bigger. And it's also, of course, um, has to be looked in another perspective. It's like more on an individual perspective. As as an individual, this is the highest. Um, kind of emitting action you can have. But in general, this is when you look at aggregates less than um, the total aggregates of road transportation. We also have shipping, of course, it has increased also quite a lot um, uh, lately. That's also around um, uh, 11%. But road is still like about seven times more. And this is why you will hear a lot about cars today. Um, so this is just a quick look at uh, regional uh, differences. Just to see that trajectories and ratio can can change a little bit across regions, but um, so for example, you can see that the impact of aviation is quite a bit in North America, not surprisingly. Uh, but but overall, again, this this um, green bars have the lion's share. So there are two implications here. Um, one is that um, our current um, transportation system is very reliant on car and trucks, um, and the second one is that. This, because these vehicles are, are running on combustion engine, mostly they are emitting a lot of CO2. And that's, um, that's a problem. Um, so th these were the current emissions, right? Like the, the, the trends from the last um, previous years. Uh, but what about the future of these emissions? Uh, and in particular for road emissions, that is what interests us most. And um, are they going to increase, decrease? Well, in uh, the current scenario is actually not looking so good. 
And um, as because as, as we all know, we need a steep decrease right until 2050 to stay within 1.52 degrees of warming compared to pre-industrial levels. Uh, well, what what we are actually foreseeing here is currently an increase um, because the sector, the automotive sector, has not been taking uh, yet the necessary measure. Um, so this is what the sector is telling us in terms of, of, of storytelling. So this is uh, how the sector is telling us we will solve uh, climate problems. So automated cars, flying cars, autonomous cars, cars turn into trains and brand new long tunnels like uh, on our little video at the beginning of the, of the talk. And um, what do you think the scientific community think about these solutions? Well, they think it's actually very limited and uncertain potential for most of them. And um, in particular, um, one, one issue is that some of these propositions are actually a smoke screen to divert public investment from actual high potential solutions, like trains powered by renewable energy. This is actually uh, what happened recently in California. According to a recent news report, and uh, you may recognize a person that we mentioned before in this talk. Um, so uh, what is actually more likely to be coming up instead of these fantasized uh, images from the previous slides is actually more and more cars um, because the industry has interest in having more and more cars, right? So as you can see um, on this figure uh, to the uh, top right, um, this is um, the number of cars produced over the last 50 years. So the trend is quite linear. And um, so this means, you know, more and more cars on the roads, more and more emissions. And also more and more externalities from cars, uh, for example, local pollutions and, and congestion. So um, a strong and very strong important bottleneck here again is that we have to be aware of um, techno optimism and not always trust, you know, what Elon Musk is saying. Even though electric vehicles that Elon Musk is uh, is fighting for are actually a quite important part of the solution, and we will get back to this. Uh, but first, I want to spend one more minute on, on this concept of externalities that I just mentioned, um, that, because it's really key. And uh, I want to ally that, that, that beyond GHG emission, it's really also important to think about sustainability more broadly, as well as fairness. Um, because transport is, is an important service and enabler for everyone, everybody's uh, life, right? It should be available to everyone. So reducing, car reducing carbon emission does not mean that we want to reduce people access to transport in general. Uh, but transport also involves those externalities, which are the cost for um, the society and people beyond uh, one, one person who is transported. So um, let's, let's take the example of, of cars again. So we have the, this person um, who's saying, uh, okay, hey city, I want to exercise my, my freedom and reside out in the suburbs. So now I want to drive through the um, fast through here without delay. So I demand that Public taxis are spent to widen our roads and um, lower our safety and health and quality of life. Sounds like a fair deal, right? Um, and so this 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 person is essentially um, claiming that the right the, the the road should be widened because this person is claiming this will improve con uh, congestions and um, this is um, the, this is going to be good for this person. But let's assume that the people to the left actually don't own a car. And so then these people have to bear all these red um, underlying things, right? They have to bear the public taxes, the safety problems, the health, quality of life, while they actually don't care about what they would get out of this, right? So it sounds like the, the, the um, solution proposed here is pretty unfair. Of course, the, the reality is often much more complicated than just all car are bad and unfair. But I think the, the, the main point here is the bottom line is to um, try when thinking about the different solutions that can be uh, proposed in the space of urban transportation to consider that there are usually multiple externalities um, that will be linked to a particular infrastructure project and that it's important to, to mitigate them. Um, okay, so um, now I would like to go back to the basics of how can we actually save energy and emissions from the transportation sector. And there are actually three main ways in the literature. Um, we can either avoid, shift or improve. So avoid is about avoiding the need for motorized transportation, for example, remote work, uh, a, virtual, a virtual CCI summer school where you don't need to travel around the world to, to attend um, this, uh, this meeting. Um, but of course, this cannot be the only solution. So uh, we also need to shift between modes. So for example, this was the first slide of Constantine. We, uh, instead of 20 cars, 
uh, with one or two occupants, we can ship to one bus. This requires way less energy to carry around the same number of people. And then we can also improve the efficiency of motorized vehicle, um, which is um, where technology and AI can potentially help the most, but it can also help on th the three levers. And, and we will uh, look at this uh, in detail later. Uh, but this is essentially the, the different options, and we uh, yeah we need to think about the three of them, not only one. Um, so um, yeah, if we if we look a, a bit deeper into uh, into avoid solutions, uh, yeah sorry. Uh, uh, so if we uh, if 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 we want to yeah look at this avoid and um, and uh, efficiency solutions and put them into like a uh, deeper um, strategies to go for actions. We can uh, look at this uh, figure that has been proposed by, by the APCC uh, on all those different solutions uh, get together and what are the different scales uh, in terms of time and also um, scales of, of adoption in terms of market uh, commerciability. So um, one solution that can be delivered immediately uh, and uh, in many countries is electric cars. And so the APCC thinks the conditions are met to scale massively uh, the market in the next five years. This is, for example, what we've been seeing in, in Norway, uh, where by focusing on charging infrastructure, grid in, uh, integration, or procurement of EV fleets, they've been able to really scale this market quite quickly. But at the same time, the APCC also recommends um, to focus on, on reducing and shifting demand, uh, for example, via uh, regulations and infrastructure developments. So for example, uh, high speed train is is an important one here, but this may take in the order of magnitude of ten years to be delivered and pro um, uh, and provide effects. So this is uh, this is something that needs to be done in also um, conjunctions with uh, approaches that can be delivered faster. And and finally, there are those like hard to decarbonize options that um, still require research and development, and that may be delivered in more a time frame of about fifteen years. Uh, if all the uncertainties actually turn out to um, be resolved. But these, these uh, re, uh, represent in general more of a niche scales compared to other solutions. So like a, a typical one here is like uh, uh, turning uh, aviation to uh, creating biofuel for aviation to make uh, fuel, um, yeah, planes uh, more, uh, more sustainable. So in, su in summary, what can we say from all this big um, chart is that we essentially have a lot of solutions, but um, one key issue is really not to scale all of them to the whole market as fast as possible. Um, and if we manage to do so, um, this is the, the these are the potential that the APCC sees in uh, those three solutions globally. So um, let, let's assume we don't take any action now. The, the, gray, uh, the first gray bar to the left represents um, the, the, the total emissions we would have in, in 2050 from uh, urban transportation, uh, so no, for the overall transportation sector. Um, and so this is about uh, 10 gigaton of CO2 per year. So this is way too much compared to what we uh, can afford from a, a, a mitigation perspective. And so you see that um, through three groups of um, different mitigation um, measures, which are socio-cultural factors, infrastructure use, and, and use technology and adoption, we can reduce um, a big uh, fraction of them. And the rest uh, is emissions that are considered that cannot be uh, avoided. And so they need to be uh, uh, taken care of by supply side solutions, such as uh, um, uh, uh, greening the electricity or um, or doing sequestration of carbon. So um, yeah, the different type of social uh, cultural factors or like teleworking uh, or active mobility that are avoid type of solutions. And then um, the infrastructure use uh, is using more public transportation, shared mobility, compact cities, special planning. So those are a mix of shift and avoid um, solutions. And then uh, end use technology adoption is uh, actually the one with the largest potential. So this is electric vehicles, more efficient vehicles. So uh, those are more improved kind of solutions. But uh, yeah, the, the three together bring us um, where, where we, we need to be. So um, 
Um, yeah, the, the, this previous slide kind of emphasized the, the importance of efficiency and uh, improved solutions that have a key role. But um, yeah, I, as, as I said, efficiency is not alone, uh, enough alone, right? And we, we also need some avoid solutions. And so this is called um, sufficiency. So this is retrofitting our usage of services to what is really actually needed. And so um, we are again with our example of uh, individual cars. And this is uh, an illustration of a typical day of a car. Um, so car um, usually being used on average one hour per day. And the rest of the time, they are typically taking up space on the streets for nothing, right? So this is um, uh, this 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 also means that if we could share car better between different users, not only we would reduce idle time, but would also reduce the number of cars we need to produce. So this may actually look like a lot of emission reductions. Uh, and so, in fact, some modeling studies are estimating that uh, we would be able to fulfill the same level of service with only 10% of the current leaders. So this is kind of um, really this idea that we can really, like what is really sufficient to uh, cut down our, our usage and uh, our CO2 emission while still providing the transportation service that we need can, um, can be very drastically uh, lower. So, um, so here, Technology, including AI, could actually help design such, such services that, that enable people in cities to have cars more easily and flexibly ac accessible when and where they need, um, without the need of owning, you know, themselves uh, a car that's mostly idle uh, the, throughout the day at larger cost from the for themselves, right? Of owning a car and also for the society. So, um, so yeah. So this this point, uh, yeah really also in a way really um, relates to fairness because we um, yeah we don't want to flood the, the world with highly efficient cars because they still have a lot of externalities so we kind of want to combine efficiency and sufficiency here um, where we have at the same time fewer um, low carbon and, and highly efficient cars if the, the, this, this is kind of like the ideal mix we would want um, so this this was kind of like the first uh, how point I wanted to uh, go through um, but um, but this, there's like another important one here coming up is that uh, if we want this kind of solution that we've been men mentioning to achieve the potential, they also need to be adopted by a large number of people, right? Who individually make decisions about when, where, and how they want to travel, to go to holidays, um, and, and, and people want to have their own car, right? Like it's not only about what makes sense from the, the society perspective, but people sometimes have their own um, perspective on things. Um, I mean, people always have their own perspective on things. So it's, it's really important to realize that it's really difficult to make people change their perceptions about their transportation behaviors and their habits. And this especially, uh, yeah, this, this aspect uh, involves some, some effort as well. <clears throat> and, um, and what really doesn't help here is that this transition towards um, climate-friendly mobility is a very contested space. So this is um, an, an article from a German newspaper. This is essentially saying, uh, look at these cargo bikes um, that these parents are now using to bring their kids to school instead of taking their SUV. They're, they are terrible because they are too big. So they are causing congestion and this is really bad. Um, but if you also look at the same time at the evolution of cars uh, over the last century, you see that actually most of the space is being used by cars, right, not by bikes. Um, so this, this, there are really like this, um, this conflicting narratives that um, fit into a quite complex picture of like what are the, the factors that contribute to to why people choose one mode over another mode. And so I'm, I'm not going to go into details here, but this is a great paper that's that's reviewing the evidence, scientific evidence we have on on this topic that shows that factors such as belief, habits, or social influence or cost of like an influence on whether people want to bring their kids to school in a cargo bike or a car. So, um, so when, uh, yeah, when thinking about the, the, the need of ship shifting to uh, a substantial share of, of car commuters to, to other modes, it's uh, really important to think about those uh, different factors and push new narratives that resonates um, with these factors. Um, yeah. 
Next, uh, one key set of, of actors that can impact those narratives and um, also many other dimensions that are important here, such as infrastructure and cost that uh, that we can see have, have like a large impact are uh, policy makers. And so uh, public policy is, is very crucial for, for the transition towards climate friendly mobility because uh, it can steer not only marginal change of one person switching from their um, combustion engine car to uh, EVs, but it can also have like a really large systemic effect at the, at the level of a whole country, of a region or a country, whichever um, uh, area that this, this government is governing. So an, an example here uh, is the recent decision by the European Union to ban combustion uh, engines from uh, uh, from car in 2035. And so uh, while this is uh, a decision that's happening late, and I, actually the, there's a lot of pushback now to uh, try to uh, go back on this decision. It's is actually still a very complicated process, whether this will happen or not. This is, if if this would happen, this is, this is really a very strong signal to the industry that they need to transition now. So this, um, because then if there's this regulatory framework that happens, then the industry is not able anymore to sell their vehicles. And so this is a big risk and a big incentive. So this this kind of policy decision can have a really extremely strong impact and make things change um, faster. More generally, uh, beyond this uh, this um, this example, there is a large portfolio of potential action that governments can take, and there is also a typical categorization in the literature to uh, to think about those different actions uh, that are usually categorized between push and pull measures. So uh, the typical um, push measures are no car or restricted access uh, restricted access zones. Um, also road pricing or speed re uh, re um, speed reduction. So they, um, they are really here to make it less convenient and cheap to use a car. So to push people away from this um, this usage. And then on the other side, you have the pool measures that are here to pull people towards uh, greener modes of transportation, so that, such as public transportation or bikes by making them, uh, them more easy, pleasant, uh, more convenient to, to use. So we uh, we essentially need a, um, a mix of both of these in different proportion, depending on cities and uh, on certain context and cultural factors. Um, but but those uh, those kind of measures are, are very important. Literature shows that they can really have a strong effect, and they are in most cases really necessary. Um, although these measures are often unpopular and uh, like can be politically costly, so. Um, yeah, this is uh, this this is these are difficult measures to to put in place, but governments do have the agency and responsibility to take such measures. Um, and uh, be, uh, to finish this section, I I want to uh, yeah highlight one area where cities can actually do a lot, and uh, this is the question of uh, street space and land use. So how the city is organized in general, and how much space goes to uh, each usage. Um, so let's look at those two streets. So on the left, we have a street where you have about 70% of the space that's for cars and about 30% that's for pedestrian that's, and, and that's it. And so from the traffic, you can see that there um, yeah, doesn't seem to be uh, any space for, for anything else, right? And so now when you look to the right, uh, we actually have dedicated lanes for buses and bicycles. So those are pull measures that I just mentioned. So they attract people because the infrastructure is better. Um, and we have less space for cars and, and parking. But we also know I've used this space to create uh, more vegetation and recreational space. And so um, did this uh, street lose its capacity to make people move around the city fast? Actually, not at all. Um, it can actually, um, it can actually. So if you look at this, um, uh, at, 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 no, at this uh, um, image where uh, things are bit, put more on uh, on like a more quantitative aspect, you can see that uh, the street to the right actually has much more capacity and can make people go faster. Uh, like more people can go through this this same space, which is. The, the primary goal of the of the streets, right? To get people to to go through um, 
from point A to point B. So this accessibility goal of, of a street. So, um, so this actually works in practice. So this is an example of Paris in Rue de Rivoli, where um, as, um, yeah, the access of safe and convenient bike infrastructure has generated a big uptake uh, in bike ridership, which is great for climate. And it's great also for active mobility of people because it has uh, great health benefits. So the urban planning is also not only about those specific small street segments, uh, it's also about the organization of the whole city. So if people can access most, uh, most service between 15 to 30 minutes biking or, or walking, then they will have much less need for uh, motorized transportation. And so this is, again, an example for, for Paris, just trying to implement this idea, which is conceptualized in the concept of 15-minute cities. And so it's, it's really fascinating to see, actually, the performance of these different uh, urban designs, where essentially, um, if you compare, this is another figure from the IPCC, if you compare a uh, walkable urban fabric a transit-oriented urban fabric and an autom automotive urban fabric. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the walkable urban fabric outperforms uh, the other two on most dimensions. So GHG emissions, health benefits, equity in terms of accessibility, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all right. So this, this was um, uh, what I had to say on climate change mitigation. I want to spend a couple more words on adaptation. Uh, and uh, because, yeah, adaptation is also something. So climate impacts are going to, going to have an impact on um, the overall urban spaces. And so, of course, also on the mobility system. And so one, uh, one question is how we can also think at the same time as we are making our mitigation measure, how can those bring also synergies with the way we can um, uh, adapt to climate change? So one interesting one is that uh, if we uh, have no a lot of electric vehicles, those have batteries, and these batteries can actually provide some additional capacity uh, in cases um, or where you have poor, poor uh, outage due to extreme weather events. So this is um, something that's um, being uh, being developed and get, get, that is not necessarily uh, making sense in all places in the world where these uh, risk of extreme weather events are are not so common, but in those particular areas, for example, on um, on islands in the Caribbean, where these are quite frequent, this is this is a strategy that has been uh, thought of, and uh, you can read more about it um, in this um, paper that's uh, on the slide. And in general, um, we this is something. Uh, so uh, the climate risk of extreme weather event is something that will have an impact on uh, the transportation infrastructure. So this is also something that needs to come in, uh, into play in the different strategies that they are uh, thinking of. And um, because these, these are creating a lot of disruptions, uh, for example, on the train network. And so this is um, actually something where AI may help because you may be able to uh, map those different um, zones, hotspot of uh, risk to uh, weather even depending on the, uh, for example, uh, topography of a space. Um, so a quick recap of um, this, this slightly longer um, part. So the uh, first key message in terms of framing is, was that we really need to decarbonize road, uh, road transport. So we need uh, less individual cars and uh, phasing out uh, combustion engines. We have emissions that are growing because the sector did not take necessary measures so far. Uh, we uh, we need to think about decarboniz uh, decarbonizing transportation also as a sustainability, a fairness problem, not only a climate problem per se. And then how to decarbonize given this uh, context. So we have uh, three options, mainly to reduce emissions in the transportation sector. It's either avoid, shift, or improve uh, the, the, the current modes. Uh, we have a behavioral and cultural change that will really underpin the adoptions of uh, those, those different solutions. Uh, we need ambitious public policies that can steer systemic change beyond uh, new marginal adoptions here and there. And um, yeah, the, the, the final um, bit I, I, I did here was that space allocation and design are one of these solutions that can at the same time improve efficiency and well-being and um, that's an understudied one and 
um, a, a pretty important one in my opinion. Um, now maybe some time for questions. If um, if anyone had, had some questions on um, on this part uh, uh, through the chat or want to quickly uh, shoot one, um, we have a little bit of time for this. Or otherwise, uh, we can take you can take a few minutes also of break to uh, shake your arms and legs before Constantine uh, starts the next part on uh, ML use cases. Yeah, do we have questions to the TAs? Yes, we, we so far we have two questions and let me read out. The first one is moving from combustion engine car to electric car is not a better solution to reduce emission since electricity is major emitter when compared to transportation. If my understanding is correct, what's better or best alternative than electric cars? Yes, yeah, so That's electric question. It's a, it's a very important question. And so the um, electric cars indeed depend on the uh, the carbon intensity of the grid. So if for electric cars to make sense, you need to have renewable energy. Um, and if you are in a country that's only using coal to um, uh, to for the power production, then in general, the carbon intensity of using the car is going to be worse. So this this is a very important thing. So this 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 solution really goes uh, go end in end, um, and then if uh, so that's why I said we don't only need uh, so uh, yeah we don't only need to uh, put electric cars on the street. We also need to do other things. Uh, that's uh, here right. So we uh, we also need to avoid. And we also need to shift, and we also need to improve. So we, it's like uh, the the first thing to do is is you know to reduce the then then to to create public infrastructure to put you know more people into the same bus, or to do things like this. So it's a and in the in this case you may still have one uh, combustion engine, but you have less people that you know that, that that will require the same combustion engine to bring them individually to a to a place. So those those solutions, there's really a pool of different solutions that um, that depend on the context of a given city, uh, but we still have some um, kind of directions. But so you can look into more details into the the IPCC report. There's like a chapter on on transportation that gives you really like the the big picture on on these questions. All right, um, and the second question goes to uh, Nicola. Um, um, the person um, pulls a problem and follow up with a question. So predicting the benefit of carpooling using AI models may need us to understand the commute behavior and pooling preferences of people, which may vary from one region to another. Now the question, how can AI models account for human behavior or consumer choice? Constantine, do you wanna take this one? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um... And I'm I'm actually going to go into this in the in the next section quite a bit. So, what AI is actually good at, and um, what kind of the big potential is, um, is is to find patterns in in kind of vast amounts of unstructured data, and um, with domain expertise embedded, um, find good decisions from that data. And um, we have we have lots of data on on, on uh, people's mobility, be that from from transportation providers or from you know cell phones, for example. Um, we have we can then correlate those those movement patterns with um, with features that might explain them, right? So commute is a very simple one, right? We know that people from the suburbs commute to the city center for their jobs in the morning, and then they commute back in the in the evening. Other trips might be more tricky, right? But for example, if you can already anticipate because you you scrape data from like event sites that uh, some concert is happening, um, you, you will be able to anticipate kind of trip demand and uh, adapt your transportation system accordingly. 
Um, and yeah, so I, I think a lot of consumer patterns uh, at this point are quite um, well understood. And thanks to the vast amounts of data we have from just scraping the internet, um, um, we, we have big advantages there. But yes, I'm actually going to go right into this uh, right now. So um, that was a great question, anticipating the next, uh, next part of the lecture. Um, yes, so. Yeah, yeah, so let's talk about ML use cases. So Nicola and I have so far really um, talked about uh, the uh, urban mobility landscape and then the connection with climate change. We haven't really gone into machine learning. And it's important that I think first the groundwork is, is, is done for understanding how does, how does uh, the transportation landscape look? How do transportation and, and uh, climate change intersect? Um, so now let's talk about how can um, can machine learning be of help. And like we said in the in the very beginning, uh, a lot of that is really about efficiency gains and about um, yeah making people switch from from one mode to another. And in order for do that, like the the last questions from the audience raised, it is very important for us to understand what people need in terms of mobility. What is uh, their travel behavior, and um, how do they how do they like to um, travel, and what do they want to travel for? And um, the reason why machine learning uh, is is really uh, impactful for helping us with that is because we have a lot of data, especially in cities, and um, there's. All sorts of different terms for this, but um, kind of the the one that I guess goes goes the furthest is the the term that is urban uh, data lakes, where you really have all sorts of unstructured data swimming around. Basically, it's 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 not harmonized in any way, but it is being collected, and and that is part of the paradigm that we call smart cities that has emerged over the last like twenty years, maybe, where we just have a lot of sensors in cities, right? So every time you um, you, you tap your uh, credit card to, to check into the subway in London, um, that is a sensor that uh, captures your trip. Um, your cell phone itself is a sensor that um, connects to a cell phone tower and you know has your whole movement trajectory throughout the day. Anytime you make a purchase in a, in a shopping street or so, that is a data point. Um, adding to these kind of individual data points come all the ones that are collected by the city, right? So the city will have climate uh, sensors throughout the city that uh, measure like stuff like temperature or wind speed. Um, there will be air pollution sensors. Um, there's data coming from smart buildings and grids. And basically all this data uh, leads to what is pretty much a, a real-time stream of data that captures all sorts of aspects of urban life. And um, Following from that, many different, um, not just cities, but governments have uh, aimed at providing a lot of that data freely to researchers, to practitioners through uh, urban open data portals. Um, and uh, yeah, picture here is from the London one, but which is a very good one, but New York, I will also mention as a great example, that with lots of public data, um, Singapore as well. And um, on top of just public providers, there's also NGOs that focus on providing data. Big ones I want to mention here is OpenStreetMap, which is yeah like a competitor to the big commercial mapping uh, projects like Google Maps or Bing. Um, OpenStreetMap is completely volunteer driven and volunteer mapped and um, everyone can have access to it and can also add new, new uh, objects to the map. Um, there's uh, things like open cell ID, which is uh, people volunteering their cell phone trajectories in an anonymized way um, as, as an open data portal. So we do already have access to all of these things, even if we're not necessarily, um, if we don't necessarily have access to proprietary data. And um, yeah, so what what these um, different layers of urban data really uh, um lead to um, for us is that they provide us with features which we can then use in our machine learning application. As I said already, these, these data layers quantify aspects of urban, urban life that might be relevant to uh, transportation. Social aspects, demographic aspects, economic aspects, and then also environmental um, uh, built environment data. And all of these um, layers interact together, as you can see on the, on the figure on the, on the right, to um, yeah, create create kind of a 
uh, create a, a data replication of, of, of the area that we are uh, interested in. And because all of this data is in time and space, we can harmonize them. So this uh, harmonization process is um, one that, for example, in a tutorial we're going to release um, later on is going to take a big part. Um, uh, as you as you also probably have heard uh, several times throughout the summer school, a lot of um, um, machine learning work is uh, just you know getting the data and shape for for your project. Um, a lot of data science work, in fact. And so um, with urban and transportation data, it's exactly the same. Um, the, the kind of common challenges here are stem from the, the spatial and the temporal uh, resolution of our data that is often um, not the same. And so we need to do stuff like spatial and temporal aggregation or disaggregation. We need to match uh, different areas. Sometimes uh, we might want to remove outliers uh, we, or we want to kind of cluster our data or detect communities. And these, these kind of processing steps are really, really key to um, um, getting uh, transportation data into a shape and, and into a form uh, where we can then use it for machine learning applications. Um, you might've heard about the term a data center guy. That term is um, yeah really uh, shaped by Andrew Eng, who, who to quote him says that, that it describes the discipline of systemically engineering the data needed to build a successful AI system, right? And um, we're seeing that more and more uh, where uh, not just companies, but also the, the public sector will collect data according to what uh, the modelers needs are, right? So I think air quality is a, is a great example where uh, cities want to create uh, better and better air quality monitoring systems. But in order to do that, uh, you have kind of a sampling problem, right? Where do you put your um, air, where do you put your um, uh, monitoring station? You have only like a restricted amount of stations, like where do you put them? And then kind of how do you collect data in a way that really machine learning systems can create your best possible air quality map? And so really, there's a big focus on best practices for labeling, curation, and scaling data. And um, there is a uh, avenue for domain experts, so early machine learning experts, but experts who understand urban planning and transportation to come in uh, and provide their expertise in, in these kind of applied machine learning projects. And again, that's something that's a theme throughout the summer school is the interplay between domain experts, machine learning experts, stakeholders. Um, this is essential uh, in, in any kind of uh, deployment that wants to make use of AI for climate action. Right, um, let me do the second case study now, um, and I'm gonna switch over to the responses in a second. Uh, but yeah, so again, the setting is your, your data scientists and you're tasked with uh, chip demand forecasting at a time and a location. So we talked about the outcome variables and how to measure trip demand. Now let's talk about uh, the next two aspects, which is, we just talked about kind of urban features. Which urban features do you think are relevant to trip demand, right? What will affect the demand for going on a trip at a given time? And then second, what uh, are kind of potential forecasting methods you would want to use? What, what models would you want to use? Do you want to use linear regression? Do you want to use something else? Um, and I will move over to the second question responses and uh, let's see if they will come in. Okay, so to the first question, so what are features to use as predictors? All right, so we have um, market demand of alternatives. Oh, so that is that is very interesting. Yeah, so if you if you're working on like a if you're working on like a trip demand modeling, especially if, if you don't have any data yourself from your own um, from your own um, sensors or your own, like you're just getting started, then actually looking at that of alternative uh, providers is, is actually a really good feature. Yes, that's that's a great point. Um, sensors, um, I, I mean, yes, everything is a sensor. I guess it depends a bit um, what you're sensing. <laughs> um, I, I can imagine sensors that are, you know, maybe not necessarily the most informative ones for trip demand. All right. Um, what are forecasting methods? Um, 
demand supply models. Uh, yes, I guess the demand is what where we want to get to. And so, yeah, the demand supply models. Um, I'm not exactly sure what is what is meant by that. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, tra traffic sensors can be used to measure density, and we can use the data to increase or decrease transportation counts. Um, it's also not exactly the answer to the question. <laughs> Let's see if more answers come in. Otherwise, I'll move on to the next part of the lecture. Let's see if I need to actually reload or now works like that. Okay, all right. Let's just move on to the next portion of the lecture. All right. Yeah, so here's um, here's the features that uh, we would come up with, right? So weather is obviously a very important factor for trip demands, right? So if you're, if you're planning to walk home, but all of a sudden it starts raining, that will definitely affect your uh, likelihood of taking a bus instead or, or an Uber. The time of day is, is super important, right? So we talked about commuting hours extensively already. I don't really need to go into that, but that can lead to all sorts of problems. Points of interest are interesting, right? So uh, in the evenings, concert and event venues might be more popular. Um, there's kind of more, more steady uh, demand for trips to airports or so. Socioeconomic and demographic factors like income will uh, affect trip demand, right? So some people are more likely to take public transport, not necessarily because they want to, but that's the only thing they can afford. And um, talking about methods now, the methods uh, that we have for like something that is very vague, like trip demand forecasting are really any, any method, right? So uh, trip demand uh, forecasting, we can break that down to usually a regression or a classification problem. So it's a predictive model. And then we, we start off with our simplest uh, linear uh, or tree-based methods. Um, however, depending on the data we have, we might need models that scale to so high dimensional data. Uh, think again that a lot of urban, urban data is provided in near real time. We also have to deal with non-linearity and account for systemic variation like this. Obviously gonna be spatial effects in the data and there's gonna be temporal dependencies. So autoregressive methods or, or spatial temporal uh, methods like graph neural networks might actually be more and more helpful. Okay, we've talked about the kind of data in cities. Uh, now let's talk about how ML is actually used in practice and in research for analyzing transportation and um, yeah, driving impact. So this is a figure from the Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning paper, the big paper that um, climate change AI members authored and uh, yeah you can you can kind of already see the different um, the different ways in which um, machine learning intersects reducing and modal shifts we've talked a lot about um, efficiency we've talked a lot about um, alternative fuels so this is this goes into the direction of material discovery we're not really going to cover that much in this lecture because it goes a lot also into yeah material sciences chemistry but uh, know that this is also uh, an area in which machine learning can have a lot of impact. And uh, yeah, this is uh, like a, a big overview on, on kind of different machine learning methods and how they can uh, be deployed in, in the transportation domain. So let's, uh, let's, let's dive into it. First off, uh, optimization with or with, without constraints. Um, this is really big, right? So how, how can we, um, given the kind of restrained resources we usually have, right? So we have like a number of uh, charging stations that we can actually afford as a company, where do we put them to most efficiently supply electricity for electric cars? Uh, if we're a, a city and want to provide uh, the kind of bike sharing system that people are more like most likely to use uh, and the most likely to, to avoid car trips or, or, or other trips, where do we put the bike stations? All of this is kind of basically an optimization problem where you want to maximize your uh, customer um, with customer satisfaction, but also usage. So how do you do that? And again, machine learning and all these kind of predictors that we've talked about can help with that. Uh, the domain of computer vision can help a lot with um, 
uh, stuff like object detection and, and traffic cameras, uh, remote sensing can help with uh, detecting changes in the urban fabric from, from satellites. Uh, reinforcement learning is uh, immensely important in, in stuff like uh, traffic modeling, congestion modeling, um, and basically the ambitions here are really big, right? The ambitions here to build um, near realistic models of, of our cities and of the mobility in our cities um, with, with agents um, and then to simulate all sorts of uh, interventions, right? And so that way we can test interventions in, in like a digital system before we deploy them, which can help us a lot to make, make better decisions. Um, market and auction design is, is especially important in, in like ride hailing services and like the gig economy. I'm going to talk about inference in a second in, in, our, in our case studies. And then, yeah, predictive models are the big ones that we've talked about a lot, so I'm not going to go into this. But yeah, this is just an overview of uh, the different uh, machine learning paradigms and how they can, um, can inform decisions in, in the transportation domain. What is important uh, uh, to consider here is that machine learning um, expertise needs to intersect with expertise in all these kind of adjacent uh, domains that um, also inform um, in, in, inform the transportation sector, right? So transportation science is an obvious one. This is an active academic research area. It's uh, very applied statistics often, but um, yeah, so that is that is obviously one that can give a lot of domain expertise. There's complex systems research, right? That looks at, you know, complex systems of interconnected layers of uh, of uh, yeah, um, dynamic systems, operations research um, and information systems research in the more like business field are really helpful. Economics, urban analytics and urban science, urban planning as well, but then also stuff like material science and geography. And really what, um, <clears throat> what machine learning falls is into this kind of uh, intersection between methods, uh, data, and applications in the in the quantitative urban sciences, and um, again, that's something we we will tell you throughout the summer school. Um, it's also important here. Machine learning is is not uh, the solution. Um, it's 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 just part of the solution, and it can be really impactful if we do it right from the beginning. Right? If we engage with stakeholders, if we engage the right domain experts, and if we use data in the correct way. So to switch gears a little bit um, and kind of talk through two examples um, of, of uh, actual deployment of machine learning in the real world, I, I've brought two case studies. <laughs> Excuse me. The first one is about transfer learning, um, urban mobility demand. And here, uh, the example is really that we, we are a mobility provider and we want to kind of, we, we are providing mobility through, uh, for, for example, car sharing in this case in one city, and we want to use the data we have to inform our decisions on how to deploy in, in, in the city B that is completely new to us. So is there a way of doing that uh, with the help of machine learning? Turns out um, this is very similar to the case study we're doing throughout. We can uh, do a trip demand prediction by uh, yeah, aggregating trips in space-time units. Um, this is our outcome variable, and then predicting it with uh, urban uh, features that we know are available not just in city A, where we have the outcome variable available, but also in city B, right? So one example for that is points of interest, which you can get from globing mapping services like OpenStreetMap completely for free. Then we can uh, build a predictive model, like a tree-based regression model, to predict the trip outcomes at a given uh, sp uh, spatial unit and a given time using the points of interest. And now, since we, uh, we, we train that model on, on our operating city where we do have the data, let's say that a, a model is trained in Amsterdam, can we actually extrapolate to a completely unseen environment where we also have points of interest data available like Berlin? And turns out we can actually do this uh, quite well. And this really is like a very methodologically very simple approach, um, but because of the data that we have and because of the ability of uh, machine learning methods to kind of find patterns, even in, in these kind of large data sets, we actually get very good guesses of where to deploy a caching system in the new town. Yeah, uh, this is actually a paper of mine, like one of my first publications, if you, if you want to check it out. Um, 
it's uh, it, it is I think um, aged a bit by now, but uh, I think it's still very relevant, uh, still a very really really relevant case study. The second example I want to give is something that is kind of more timely thing, and that is something that um, we're talking a lot about ride hailing services. Uber, for example, is like his whole team's working on this, and that is the problem of causal discovery in in uh, in uh, interconnected cities environments. So how can we evaluate the causal effect of, for example, a new feature or like a new policy that Uber has? So in this example, it's like choosing between an electric vehicle and a traditional vehicle in the app, which you can do on Uber. What effect does giving that option to customers have on the ride hailing trips? And here, uh, the metric or like what we want to do is really want to see a difference in utilization rate. Uh, for example, the percentage time that a vehicle is idle for electric vehicles that are part of our ride hailing service. And um, the way to uh, approach this uh, kind of classic in like very classical um, causal discovery is to just do A-B testing, right? So we split our customer base into a treatment and a control group. The treatment group gets this new option, right? They all see in their, in their Uber app, uh, you know, trip with a normal car, trip with an electric car. Um, and then there's a control group which uh, does not uh, get this option. And then you just compare the difference in your outcome uh, var uh, variable between uh, both groups, problem solved, right? No, unfortunately we can't do this because, uh, and there's again like an inherent problem with transportation data and especially in cities, we have something called network effects. The problem is those groups are not independent, the treatment and the control group because the change in behavior of the treatment group will actually have effects on the on the other group, right? Because for example, if uh, the um, treatment group all of a sudden now starts to only take electric, ve uh, electric vehicles, that will lead to an oversupply in non-electric vehicles, will, uh, which will also affect the uh, control group. So causal discovery uh, is not possible because those two, are, uh, two groups are not independent. Um, there are different ways of overcoming this. I'm just going to very briefly talk about the two most popular ones. Um, the first alternative is to do switchbacks, which means that instead of just doing one split of your customer base into treatment control group, you do many different splits according to different space time units you design, right? So you can see that in the top figure, you have like, let's say, three different regions, A, B, C, and then you have, uh, yeah. 30 minute time slots. And so you have these kind of space time cubes and you switch back and forth between having a space time cube being a treatment and control group. That way you randomize this effect and uh, you can do your causal discovery. The second alternative is uh, do something that is called synthetic controls. Uh, synthetic controls is basically where you build a really good forecast method of your metric. Uh, again, in, in this case, it's uh, something like the time, time idle of uh, EVs. You forecast that using whatever predictors you find useful for that. Um, so again, there's going to be similar predictors to our example of trip demand forecasting. And then you build a predictive model that extrapolates into the future. You implement your uh, policy uh, in your uh, treatment group, and you see how the actual, uh, the actual uh, outcome variable changes. And then the difference between what you predict and the, uh, the, the actual observed uh, treatment effect the, uh, the actual observed uh, metric that you uh, that you see, um, that difference is going to be your treatment effect. And uh, yeah, there I've I've linked some examples uh, that go further into this into in the notes of these uh, slides, so you you can read much more about this. Uh, yeah, here's the link actually as well. But I think I've added it as well to the end of the notes. But since you have access to the slides, you'll be able to see that. Right, um, let's uh, talk about some emerging trends briefly. So this is kind of the more cutting edge machine learning that's being used um, and um, how it's kind of replacing uh, more traditional methods, right? So I was talking a lot about tree, tree best methods and regression. Um, and while these are still very powerful and in some cases we actually need uh, some of this really new machine learning innovations. One good example is graph neural networks, right? So especially if you want to model complex spatial temporal patterns, 
What is used off the shelf often for that is uh, Gaussian processes, which because they are kernel methods can account really well for spatial temporal dynamics. The problem with uh, Gaussian processes is that they don't really scale well to high dimensional data because they need to, they need to compute pairwise distant matrices, so they have a cubic uh, scaling. Uh, yeah, squared uh, scaling. And um, what we can do instead is use some graph neural networks uh, that are much faster and uh, also able to capture spatial temporal, uh, spatial temporal methods. Uh, constraint focused methods uh, in decision and control and planning. So this is something you'll have heard a lot about in the previous lectures on energy systems, for example. So there's a whole uh, subfield of machine learning working on, on these kind of methods. Um, I went a bit into causal discovery with machine learning just now, right? So in, 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 in the case of kind of complex network effects, how can you do causal discovery? Multi-model deep learning is becoming more and more important. A lot of the urban sensors we were talking about before do not provide the same kind of data modality, right? So you'll have a sensor like a traffic camera that actually returns a video stream. You'll have a sensor like uh, just a microphone that maybe uh, captures bird song in cities. Uh, and then you'll have uh, data like tweets that people send in a city, right? So these are three different modalities, audio, video, and text. Um, and what we're seeing right now is, is like a big trend towards models that are universalist, right? That they can deal with all these different modalities together and uh, gain insights from them. And lastly, and I've also touched about this a little bit, um, there's lots of funding, especially coming in for digital twinning cities and digital twinning transportation systems, building these really large scale simulation environments where you can uh, yeah, digitally test policies because, before you implement them. Um, and yeah, maybe like last cool example I want to give, because this is something that Climate Change is actually funded through our innovation grants program, is a, a project called Green Last Mile, and you can check out their website at greenlastmile.ai. And yeah, this is uh, basically uh, using reinforcement learning to route uh, delivery bikes. And um, we also have a blog post on this on the CCI blog. Um, yeah, it's just a really cool uh, case study of you know how can uh, machine learning actually be useful in in the transportation domain and for uh, yeah climate action. Right. Um, let's uh, move on from. Um, the machine learning use cases to, to the outlook section. And so I'll, I'll give a bit of an outlook on how the mobility landscape is changing in general. And then um, Nicola will talk about uh, pathways to impact um, in ML for transportation. Right, and so this section I'm really basing on a, on a cool report by McKinsey. It's, it's, it's already quite old, but I think it's still very relevant um, in the way it kind of splits up the different developments we are seeing in the, in the mobility domain. And um, the first the first thing here is to kind of understand the different layers of how change in urban mobility is driven. And they, they guess the most outer layer here in this figure, which is this gray one, is the, the enablers of change, right? And the enablers of change are for one technology. This is, I guess, where we re revolve around. Technology is not, of course, not just machine learning. It's also innovation in you know, new vehicles and, and, others, uh, and fuels and other stuff. That there's there's financing, both public and private sector financing. Um, yeah, that's the, the new business models, right? I think the biggest one we've seen there in the last 10, 20 years is, is ride hailing, which really completely disrupted the urban mobility landscape. The second layer we have is what is delivering the mobility and what is shaping the mobility system. Right, so we have uh, policies uh, reg and regulations, we have uh, urban planning and design, and we have consumer behavior and preferences that are really shaping the mobility landscape. And um, then we have the, the deliverers, right? So these are private, privately owned vehicles um, and these are public vehicles and yeah, new services in, in, in either way. Um, because we have that here, uh, and, and this is something we haven't really talked about this throughout the lecture, I think, it is really important actually to understand the consumer preferences and behavior point here. Really driving change in the transportation domain will often require a bit of a cultural change. And um, I think the US is a great example for that because the US is very car centric and having a car is kind of being seen as a yeah, requirement for you know, kind of living a, a good and successful life. 
And public transportation is often very frowned upon. Um, and if you compare that to a city like London, where basically everyone takes public transportation, you know, the richest banker takes public transportation and um, the person working at McDonald's too, just because it's the fastest way to get around, right? But what it really reflects is kind of a cultural, uh, a cultural difference in, in these uh, places. And so this kind of consumer preference and behavior aspect is actually super important. And um, cultural change is kind of needed in order for us to really decarbonize uh, mobility. Yes, uh, so next up, uh, individual and uh, group uh, mobility are changing both and they're changing both quite rapidly. And uh, again, I, I think ride hailing is great because it actually affects both, right? So ride hailing is changing both individual transportation, like individual taxi Uber trips, but also there's stuff like uh, uh, Uber pool. And um, ride hailing companies uh, don't just exist in the, in the Western world. Um, there's a big growth of ride hailing companies and kind of pooled ride hailing uh, in, in many low income countries. And it kind of really is helping people to get around. The investments in the mobility sector are growing like uh, crazy. And again, this is a rather old figure, but um, it, it is still the case. And uh, one thing the ride hailing services showed is that even though um, transportation in cities is dominated by public actors, who again, they often don't have the kind of profit pressure, there's still money to be made. And uh, since then, since kind of the emergence of Uber, Lyft and, and the likes, uh, really uh, many more of these services have sprung up, right? You can all think about the kind of scooter companies that you see everywhere, like Lime. Um, investors have realized that even, even in this kind of very competitive markets, there's money to be made. And yeah, oh, I, I think I've missed the changing here. So the whole landscape is really changing uh, fundamentally from individual ownership as the dominant form of transform to ownership as only one of many different forms, right? So there are many people, I, I would include myself in that. I don't have a car. I'm, I'm signed up for like car sharing services like Zipcar. So if I need one, I can get one. But um, it's just not really attractive to me. Um, there's uh, from, from limited consumer choices to many, many choices, right? So getting from A to B, when, when it used to be like bus versus car, now it's bus versus car versus Lime scooter versus uh, car sharing bike versus Uber, right? So you have many, many more options from purely government funded public transit to also a uh, public uh, trend or like a pool transit that is operated by, pri by the private sector. And from kind of detached systems to uh, connected systems, right? So from, you now have at every train station, you'll have like a shared uh, bike station. So to actually interlock these kind of transportation systems. And yeah, and, and Nicola is also gonna go into this a little bit later on, but this point is super important. Many different cities, different transportation environments are gonna experience massively different changes, right? So you have kind of the, the rise of mega cities with like millions of people that are very uh, public transportation focused. Um, in, in, in smaller cities, you will see very different effects. Um, yeah, and so the, the way this figure shows it is between population density and the kind of quality of uh, public transit. This is, uh, I think, also a great overview slide, and I'll just leave it to you to revisit and uh, hand it over to, um, oh, I have one more slide and then I think I'll hand it over. <laughs> so yeah, the current urban mobility, well, revolution, strong word, but I, I guess I stand by it. It's, it's really like a fundamental change. Um, I think in, in many ways it could not have happened with AI adjacent tech, both uh, in hardware and software from robotics to kind of ubiquitous computing and sensing to large scale analysis, optimization under constraints, uh, market auction design. There's a great uh, report by the EU from three years ago on this that I can recommend if you wanna dive deeper into all of this. And yeah, um, Nico, I, I think you, you, you're doing this case study, right? So I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, back to me. So yeah, so this uh, this case study will uh, give us like a last a break until the, the 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 final part of the section. So we um, yeah we've heard from Constantine about machine learning, 
use cases. So the different ways machine learning could be used in mobility research and practice. We got some outlook on um, how those different uh, uh, machine learning techniques may also interfere and uh, be intertwined with a uh, new uh, development of, of the sector. And so um, now we'd like to uh, go back to our little interview and do the, the, the first um, final part of this interview. So again, as a reminder, the, the, the question was to uh, do this uh, like a demand forecasting model uh, in a, <clears throat> a big uh, ride hailing um, company where we want to project uh, a trip demand. So first, we've been asking the question, OK, how do we actually first uh, get an idea of what's the, the target variable, this trip demand? The so second question was, um, how can we come up with a bunch of predictors that will be predictive of this um, uh, trip demand uh, given a specific machine learning model? And now um, we will ask what happens after. So you came up with this model and uh, now it's time to, to test it and deploy it. So what, what's your intuition about the best ways to, to test and deploy a model uh, in the real world? And then um, what's the, actually, what's the point of doing this in the end? Like what's the, because how do, how do you want to use this model uh, in, in a climate, uh, climate change mitigation context? What's the climate relevance of, of this deployment? So um, a few minutes now to uh, uh, discuss test deployment and relevance um, of the model. And we'll start looking into the answers. So we actually um, have one here. <clears throat> so uh, on the test and deployment of the of the model, so object-based classification. Um, so object-based classification is a method, I would uh, say, as opposed to a test. Um, the climate, general climate relevance, raise awareness for decision maker. Yeah, this is an Im important point that um, by better understanding uh, demand, we can raise awareness for what is necessary in terms of change, either of urban infrastructure or um, different services, uh, mobility services. Do we have more answers coming in? I feel like there's a lag. Okay. Um, for the test and deploy, we have a second answer that proposes to pick a small test region for deployment where outcomes are easily observable, meaning not too noisy. Um, yeah. And we need to do validation and testing indeed. We want to do a unit testing, validation testing, and continuous monitoring. Those are good points. On the climate relevance, we want to optimize traffic flow. Yes, that's, that's a thing, but uh, one is to be careful that this is not, this may not be the one and only um, metric that you want to look at because there's a long history of trying to optimize traffic flow, for example, by adding new lanes to um, the roads. And this has typically led to a lot of rebound effects, meaning uh, traffic is more uh, efficient and then more people will now start using this road because actually people were not using this road so much because they were. Um, the, 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 there was this externality linked to congestion, so it was taking time. So now that it's taking less time because we have optimized the traffic flow, actually more people come, and then the traffic flow is actually getting worse again. So this is this is a tricky one. Um, but this this uh, this has a, some value, but it's a it's a tricky one. Uh, explore ways to optimize transportation resources and reduce waste. Yes, that's also an important aspect. So. Um, Quickly going through the uh, answers we gave. So on the testing side of things first, uh, really important to keep in mind that any deployment, um, for example, if you will have a pricing scheme driven by your forecast demand for your uh, right hailing uh, app, really needs to be tested first. So um, because if your model is not functioning the way you are hoping to, this, this will have real world implications. 
<clears throat> so um, a simple A-B test would not work here um, due to the potential network effects. So you, you may want to use more sophisticated testing um, like switchback or synthetic control. So uh, Constantine has been, has been talking a little bit about all this. Um, you you, you want to think about the side effects. So um, customers and driver might not both adapt to your pricing scheme if they uh, can identify the pattern. So if they can, in a way, trick the model, uh, they, they might lead to a change of, of in behavior, which can render your prediction less accurate. So it's really um, the, the suspect that um, if you implement something in the real world, then things may change. And if your model, the machine learning model is static, um, this may create some, some issues. So uh, this is actually something we're getting into in a second in the pathway to action. Uh, deployment, so you've tested your model, now you want to deploy it. Uh, why deploying um, such a, a demand forecast model? So um, it can be, for example, used to anticipate demand in certain areas at certain time, kind of high level. So um, this means that the driver can be sent to those location in advance so that they can catch the demand. And so, for example, you could in in incentivize trips that go to projected high demand area um, by paying driver more to go there or by reducing prices for customers going there. These are like kind of a kind of like bigger deployment package and like beyond the 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 demand forecast algorithm. What how could you turn this into a a, a, a fully fledged product? Then now, what's the point of doing this from a climate perspective? Um, what you like, yeah, the, the, the general relevance is that, um, again, we want to reduce the number of personal cars because they are, uh, inefficient because they are, um, the, the gram of CO2 emissions per person going from point A to point B in many cars is not as good as if you reduce this, this number of cars. Uh, so both in terms of stocks, you want to have less idle car parking and less use, and also in terms of driving. Uh, you want to have less driving with um, with one of your uh, occupants, but you want to have more of them, which happens uh, in the case of pool shared mobility, but not shared mobility. So like purely taxi uh, um, could be one uh, or two person. Pool shared mobility is actually really trying to also maximize that aspect. So we are talking about efficiency and, and sufficiency. Uh, the purpose is to match demand for transportation with a supply in a flexible way that make uh, users keen on shifting away from the personal car. So this touches on the point of uh, really changing habits and uh, culture because, and also taking into account the fact that people have a reasonable uh, reason why they want to have decent uh, that travel patterns and the, um, why well, they're using this in that mode. And so um, it's, it's important to also really take that into account and, and offer appropriate uh, solutions. Uh, then what would be the mechanisms for, for this whole thing to happen? So you would have a shared high right ailing um, that like much better when, when, when possible. So uh, the, the positive aspect would be here only if there is a substitution from car and not from bike users. So that's you know, we're really talking about this this model shift, like what's what's mold is, is substituting substituting to which which other one. I just mentioned before with this traffic flow optimization, one needs to be uh, be aware of um, aware of uh, rebound effects. So, more people on the road overall, uh, because the service is so cheap and so efficient. So it's going to actually create additional demand, which is not necessarily what you may want to have. It is may what you want to have from a business perspective, but not from a climate perspective. And uh, one thing to keep in mind also is the computational cost. So, running a constant trip demand forecasting leads to emissions. Uh, such as like GPU energy cost or, or the server space. So one may want to think about what's the best way at the same time to update uh, your model that is not uh, you know based on something that happens one year ago while a lot of things happened in the city. For example, you had a, a global pandemic and then people have completely changed their um, mobility behavior, but at the same time, not necessarily real time if there's no need for it. So kind of like thinking about uh, what's the least computationally costly uh, and therefore energy costly way to achieve the kind of prediction you need. So this was the last um, uh, little case study. And so I will 
quickly um, conclude this um, uh, lecture by talking a little bit about pathway to action. So putting all this together, um, this knowledge that we've got about uh, the urban mobility landscape, the relevance for global clim climate change mitigation, the different machine learning algorithms that are out here and the different data uh, lakes that we can use in, in a conjunction with those uh, algorithms. And so the, the current uh, outlook and context of how we can put this into uh, um, applications that uh, can go from like a little proof of concept that you uh, first come up with in an academic paper to something that's deployed on the ground and that's actually having an impact. Uh, so I'll try to go quickly through, through that as we don't have so much time anymore. And you can also, we'll keep a, a few minutes at the end for, for some final questions. So also feel free to uh, drop some in the chat um, while I'm presenting this. So I, I want here to, uh, yeah, go over a few important elements, uh, important elements to, to consider when, when thinking about machine learning project in the space of urban transportation. And so a few things to check to try to ensure that the, the project has a realistic pathway to climate impact, meaning that you can realistically reduce CO2 emissions. So there's like many different aspects to consider. And so it's just a superficial overview, but it's just to give some, some ideas. The one critical aspect for sure is whether you actually have the actual data you need um, readily available in a given city, because cities can be incredibly different in terms of data availability. And it's not only a urban rural divide, but it's um, it, it can it can really vary in our personal experience of a PhD. We, we have really been able to see this from, from a city to another for reason you may not be able to um, intuitively think of before. It's really important to scope whether the relevant data exists and also which stakeholder own or manage the data. So in case the data is not really readily available, uh, this may also need that the, the, there are going to be a lot of efforts that you will need to put into creating capacity to collect the data. There's also possibly uh, some additional machine learning based data, data generation work. I've been working quite a bit on that. Or simply but the project is just not suited for this area at the moment well, until this, this data just uh, is available. Then the second aspect is that uh, you also have technical challenges uh, when working with real world data. So uh, some important ones include the noise in the data coming from sensors or the upstream processing. Uh, also sometimes the lack of representativeness of like a little sample, uh, the, the, the only limited sample that you can access. And, um, and also the fact that patterns may change over time, as we mentioned. So a demon projection model that is trained on data from last year may not be valid next year. So there, there, there are technical solutions for many of these problems, but the, what's important is that they require to be, uh, you need to be careful uh, about and think about them when you are building a methodology, uh, and also draw implications uh, from the results of the model. So when, when you are doing policy advice, it's important to reflect on uh, these kinds of, of technical challenge that may be in the data. <clears throat> uh, a rated point is that the interaction between um, uh, with the users. Uh, so um, it it will often uh, not look like what the, the interaction will often not look like what you can expect. Ex ante, so it's also important to integrate feedback loops in the project and have those flexibilities to adapt to, to feedback. Um, a fourth point is the relationship with local governance. So as we've stressed multiple times uh, throughout the talk today, uh, local governance are key stakeholders for, for many uh, urban mobility solutions because they are regulators and also they are funders of the solutions often. It's important to consider that um, Certain municipalities are more or less open and well equipped to deploy uh, uh, new innovative technologies. So some cases they will be a key ally, but in um, some others they may also be really difficult partners to work with. So it's important. It is an important consideration when aiming to scale a solution from one to to many cities. Uh, next, uh, we talked um, a lot about moving away from uh, um, private car ownership. And the fact that it's not an idea that everybody likes, in particular the, the big uh, car industry that uh, produces cars. So I won't explain this um, uh, uh, slides in detail, but I really recommend you to read this really uh, important paper by uh, Giulio Mattioli and, and colleagues that's in the reading. And uh, it really helps understand how the automotive industry really lobbies for the status quo and how effective this, this lobbying is and how this may impact your, you know, new cargo bike business that you want to have and uh, that 
this this may have something to do to do with the way this this will work out or not. Uh, now, two points that we did not address today but require uh, uh, attention. Uh, first, the, the relevance of non-urban transportation, because we were really mostly talking about urban transportation now, so includes rural, rural area where um, part of the solution discussed today do not apply or are there to deploy. And also the, the two other elephants in the room, freight and aviation. So this, all of these require solutions as soon as possible because they also um, are responsible for a substantial share of uh, GHG emissions. And so... Um, they, they, they are really uh, relevant use cases for machine learning. So you can uh, look in, in these di the directions. Um, the, the, the second point um, I, we, we decided not to cover today beyond the, the figures of, of global trends and, and the potential um, of how to um, decarbonize urban mobility in the global south while also aiming to provide universal access to basic transportation needs. This is a conscious decision from us because we believe machine learning may not be the first entry point uh, in these regions, and that instead, um, basic infrastructure and capacity building often uh, seems to be a more important priority. Um, but it also doesn't mean that there is no room for machine learning. So for example, uh, Uber has been uh, using machine learning in Kenya for planning their, their tuk-tuk service. So I, I leave it to you to determine whether you think this is a, a positive thing or, or not that Uber entered in the tuk-tuk market in, in Kenya. But this is just to show some cases um, where it, it may be possible to use machine learning to support the deployment of new transportation infrastructure and uh, services in the global north. And another point is that transportation systems uh, can be very di different. So for example, it can be a large share of uh, informal services. So trying to in, in, uh, apply a framework from the global north is likely not a great solution. So um, instead, why may one first to, to listen to uh, local problem owners and, and first take their perspective as, as a starting point. Um, exactly. So, um, and, and finally, I want to uh, emphasize again, uh, the importance of uh, system thinking um, and to embed our envisioned solution in, in like a broad, theory of change that uh, also links the urban transportation um, solution that we are proposing to the other relevant systems in the city. So as we discussed in this one question, there's a big link between uh, electric vehicles and the uh, carbon intensity of the grid. So one is to consider also the energy system. One wants to also consider land use, urban development as a whole. So it's like this is like really multi-governance context. And, and of course, at the end of the day, people. So um, uh, it's, it's it's really important to have this, uh, do have a theory of change? How is my uh, solution going to in, um, have uh, effects and are going to um, interplay with those different other systems in the city? And uh, yeah, see this as a, as a whole system. And so this, this may enable to, to mitigate uh, the occurrence of some unexpected side effects, adverse side effects, um, and uh, also to realize later that the solution that in its own seemed to be nice does actually not necessarily work well on deployed because it's not well adapted to the broader context uh, in which it is deployed. Um, so yeah, I think that's it for the content for today. So we have a list of readings um, that uh, we encourage you to have a look into. There are also tutorials, notebook and data sets. I will uh, present one nice tutorial um, developed by Constantine and colleagues uh, next week. And um, we have a little bit of time for questions, if there are still some. Yes, we have one question. No question. Mm -hmm. Yes. The question how, how do you think the shift to green uh, freight transport can fit in with the shift to green passenger transport? And how can AI fit in? I'm thinking, for example, of AI for train scheduling, for example. Yeah, I think a lot of the the lessons bet between freight and, and personal transport are like they are interchangeable like stuff like new fuel technology will help both stuff like 
yeah, like you, like the question mentions, like optimizing and scheduling, route planning. This this can all um, like these 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 insights are somewhat interchangeable. Um, let me think about something. I think the biggest so some of the biggest um, kind of effects I think or like the biggest differences is um, sea travel, and uh, so a lot of uh, kind of the global yeah exchange of goods is is done through the oceans. And we didn't really go into kind of uh, into marine travel at all, uh, marine trips. But there's a, yeah, there's a there's a lot of potential there to um, also uh, kind of um, figure out better ways of maybe you know optimizing that um, ship shipping is is a huge emitter um, of uh, of uh, uh, yeah greenhouse gases. Um, but yeah, I'm also not like a super an expert on that, um, but like. I know that there's kind of there's a uh, machine learning deployed for like um for example predicting um weather events or like the mm, basically having having ships go around certain weather events that are adverse that might prolong trips or so which will then also lead to more emissions so there so stuff like that is an deployment that is maybe different from a uh, uh, kind of passenger transportation but Overall, more they they there are a lot of the insights between between them align. Thank you so much. There, there is no more question. So. Great. Thanks. Thanks everyone for showing up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, hope you got a few insights from this lecture. And uh, there are a few more coming up, right? A couple more to go. All right, then, um, yeah, you. wishing you, uh, everyone a good uh, end of the week. And uh, yeah, hope to see um, some people in the space of uh, urban transportation and machine learning um, maybe next year at some of our workshops or um, yeah, looking forward to chatting in the circle community um, space. Yeah, so hope you got some insights and a little bit of inspiration from, from today. All right, bye-bye everyone.